Welcome to another episode of Field Phone Ops. Today we're going to look at a TSEC KY68 Digital Voice Subscriber Terminal, or DSVT. So go ahead and sit back, and I hope you learn something. Okay, and here we go. This is a TSEC, a KY68 Digital Subscriber Voice Terminal. Now this unit right here was actually demilled. Otherwise, I couldn't have it, so basically they removed all the circuit cards and everything from the inside of it so I could have it. So it's been demailed. It'll never work again. If I manage to get one of these at work, the FBI would be knocking at my door. Anyway, these were developed in the uh, mid-70s as part of the Department of Defense TriTac program, and it was uh, as part of what's called the Vincent family of voice encryption devices, and this was fielded from uh, the mid-80s and used until uh, in the uh, 2010s. When I retired in 2012, we still had some of these mounted in some of our shelters that we used. So this is it right here. Um, it was designed to be uh, used for uh, voice encryption traffic up to the classification level of secret. Uh, could be used as a dial phone connected to a what's called a ComSec parent or subordinate switchboard. So you can actually make four wire dial calls using the dial pad, or you can connect it up to a power supply that came with it and do a point to point with another KY68. And that way it would just be a point to point, and that was it. Used a H350 handset right here, which looks like the 250, but it was designed uh, for phone use. Same handset that a DNVT uses, and here just to get a size comparison, there is a DNVT size-wise compared to it. This weighs about 15 pounds. They're pretty rugged. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody would actually take them forward into a foxhole, but I'm sure you could use them into a bunker. Or we use them in tents, shelters, backs of trucks, uh, buildings, whatever it was possible to use them in. Um, let's go ahead and we'll flip it over and we'll do the, uh, the the bottom tour first. The interesting thing about this is they gave you the operating instructions on the bottom, which was nice. So if you may complain, you can look over the back. These little rubber feet right here, if I unscrew it, if I remember right, I think it's an 8 32nd screw can be used. So you can take these little rubber feet out and you can actually wall mount this or mount this to a panel. We used to do that a lot, so, so that's it right there. So now we're going to go, go ahead and we'll do uh, <clears throat> the actual back of the rear. And this is the rear of it right here. It's got uh, the binding post right there. Uses four wire digital. It won't work with any of the analog phones. Uh, transmit lead and receive leads right there. Um, it had a grounding lug. So you could put a ground wire on it if you wanted to. It's neat because they gave you this little hole right here so you could tie your wire off to it, so it sort of help you control your wire so it won't pull them out. Uh, this was the power connection right here. These used a special power supply that plugged into right there so they could uh, do point to point or for some reason if you, uh, <clears throat> lots of times they wouldn't go through uh, the filters on the sides of shelters. The power from the switch wouldn't. So if we put the power on the phone inside the shelter, we could still push the signal out. This is the external port right here. This phone was designed to be used as, or excuse me, with, and there's actually an extension phone that you can connect to this called an KY78, similar to this. Just it's got like a black desk phone. It's got a long cable that plugs into that. This also allows you to connect digital data devices on it, like uh, we used to use uh, UGC-144 teletypes connected to this, or a UXC-7 uh, fax machine, or uh, CryptoTech actually made a fax. You could send faxes. They also made a device uh, called an MSC interface. It was uh, about the size of, I don't know, a couple packs of cigarettes. And what was neat about it is you could plug it in here, you could plug it into a laptop computer into the serial port, and then you could use hyperterminal. You could actually transfer files back and forth, which was really cool in the field because we didn't have uh, any kind of internet at the field. Uh, so you could send an encrypted like, Word document or something like that, and it'd be kept secure by the phone. It's a little breather port right there to keep the air pressure right. These were pretty well pressurized and sealed good. Let's flip it around to the front. <coughs> It's got a battery compartment. Now the battery was used for one thing. The battery was used to hold the cryptographic fill. 
because in order to, for this to, to, to load this and put key material in it or fill, you had to have power to it. So you would hook to the switchboard, the switchboard would give you power, it give you let you load the phone, or you had it connected to a power supply, let you load the phone, but as soon as you disconnected from the phone, it would drop all the keys that were in it. So that's what this was for. <coughs> this is the actual loading port right here, where your fill device picked it. It locked onto that, and that's where you uh, suck basically the keys out of electronically. This right here is where the actual controlled cryptographic item plate used to be. These phones are actually controlled items. Um, they track them by serial number. All the cards, circuit cards, that's six circuit cards. Uh, there were certain ones that were tracked serially by the phone. I remember getting a message one time wanting them to go out and from uh, Kelly Air Force Base, which is where the Air Force Cryptographic Center was, they wanted us to go out and pull three of our KY-68s. They gave us the serial numbers and have them open them up and verify the cards that were in them. So they actually did keep track of which cards were in which phones to make sure that nothing got messed up. Um, this is the non-secure warning light. If this phone was... Uh, you pick the phone up to make a call and the number you called was not another phone like this and not secure, you get a warning there. Non-secure warning will let you know. You also get a tone and heads up. That means that you're a non-secure phone. And then as long as you're talking to that other party, say it was maybe, an, it could have been another, a dial-up call to a, a DMVT. As long as you were on that call, that non-secure warning light would come on. It's basically an indicator to tell you, don't talk about classified stuff, this is a non-secure line. This is the variable storage selector switch right here. This is spring loaded. And this was used to either, uh, I mean, we could be loaded by going like that, or you could zeroize, which means you erase the cryptos, the variables that were stored inside here. Function selector switch. This is, was the main switch that made the unit operate. Basically, disables just that it's not working. Then when we got ready to use it, let's say we we're going to get set up to a had a mission coming up. We'd load our fill device on here, we'd lock on there, and we'd select the key we wanted. Then we'd flip this to what's called LDU, which stands for load DU variable. Then we'd uh, flick it like that, and the phone would beep, and you get a flash on the fill device, which would stick it up on this, to let you know you'd loaded a U device, or a U variable. Then you'd flip it to the X variable. It beep beep again at you, you look and see, and you got a good fill on that. At this time, you could remove the fill device and switch it over to operate. And at that time, we usually would pick it up off hook to verify we get dial tone. Because the first time you did, it would have to negotiate with the switchboard. Because it's funny, when you set these up, the switchboard you connected to a ComSec switch knew this was a secure phone. So it would exchange information with it, saying, are you secure? You know, all this stuff, and you hear beeps and clicks in synchronization, and then you get dial tone. Once you got dial tone, good to go. This had one interesting thing on it. It had what's called SLAR, which stood for Special Variable. We never used this, but what it allows you to do is, let's say you were calling somebody and you had some information that was secret, but they still didn't want to, they still wanted to protect it even more. You could take your fill device with a special key on there and hook it on there, and they do the same thing on their end. And you push it to S var and hit load, and it'd load a one-time S var or special variable that you could use to make the call. And the call was as good as as long as you kept the receiver off hook the call would work, but as soon as you dropped it, it would drop that key. So, I've never used that. That's sort of a weird thing that's on there. Ring busy light is just like, is just that. If it's ringing, you'll get a beep and it sounds just like a DNV key to beep. And you get a light on there. Also, if you get a busy indicator, you'll get a light on there. Extension, this is the interesting part. These, like I said, you could connect onto the port on the back and we used to use them in our uh, operations module where our weapons controllers were. They actually hung onto the wall, were fastened to the wall, but the operators could access them through their uh, their console comm system. So that's how it worked. We also did some work. We got special permission to do some work. We built some boxes and interfaces to allow these to interface into some commercial switchboards. A lot of virtual switchboards or comm systems we do some experimentation with. We weren't allowed to do live classified data, but we did get permission to go ahead and hook them up and figure out well, if we were going to go this route, what we'd have to do. So we did that. It's, it's an interesting thing. Volume controls right here. Audio volume. Ringer volume. Highlighted the ring. Standard keypad with that on there. The R doesn't stand for readout. It actually stands for radio. 
These phones were designed, like I said, to work with ComSec parent switches, but they also work with, uh, the Army had a system called mobile subscriber equipment, and it was like a giant cell phone network that used military phones. And they had the ability to access radio nets over it, and that's what that was for. That was part of the radio network stuff. I never worked with that, so I don't know. I just know that's what the button's for. But that's pretty much it. Um, if you took this front panel off right here, there's uh, uh, some boards in here. There's jumpers on one board. You can set what's called a mode on it. And you can also change the data rate. You can either function at 16 or 32. So what you do is you would go ahead and adjust it. There's a little marker right here. You'd mark the data rate and which mode it was in. We always operated these into in mode 2 because we had a message that came down and told us to do so. I don't know what the difference is. Uh, we didn't ask. We just ran them in mode 2 like we were told to. These were used by all branches of the U.S. military. Um, they were not issued or sold to any foreign countries. NATO did have a couple phones that were comp compatible with this. You could call, take a secure call from a KY-68 to a, a thing called a, uh, a, I think it was a Spendex, Spendex, which was a European-made phone. It looked like sort of like KY-68, but it was capable of loading the same key material so you could talk back and forth. And the old a system called Stu3 was capable of doing this. And the thing about this was, if you didn't have the right crypto variable loaded, this phone wouldn't talk to the other phone. Basically what happened, if you got an incoming phone call, and you picked it up, and you'd get a what's called a non-secure warning, you'd go, you'd actually get a heartbeat, you'd go da 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 This light would flash, that means someone who's calling you is calling on an unsecure phone. So what you'd do is you'd reach over here, and pop that up. You hear it click? It now lets you make a uh, talk to them. And put this non-secure warning. That's how you could make a, a non-secure call. Same thing if you wanted to call somebody that wasn't on a secure phone. You'd go ahead, go off hook, pick this up. It would tell the phone you're making that and dial action. Excuse me, I didn't do it. You'd pick the phone up, dial the extension number you want, the people you wanted to talk to. You'd get a da 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 and non-secure warning because it's not a secure phone. You would then pop this up, it override that warning, and you could make a phone call. What was nice about that, once you hung it back up, it locked that switch back down. But this is pretty much it. Uh, it took a special switchboard to use these. Um, there's a switch of switchboards, a uh, TIC-39, which was basically 744 lines, could use this, or could operate one of these. Same with another switch called the TIC-42, which is smaller. We used ours with what was called a uh, SB-3865, which is a 30-line switch, but we had two of them. You could stack them so we could go from uh, 30 lines to 60 lines to 90 lines via another switchboard. We never really got many about 30, but that, that's how it worked. Um, it was a good phone. It was like I said, it was heavy. They actually made a case for them that I found when I was still in the Air Force, and I tried to order a bunch of them. They're a thousand dollars a piece, and my boss got really mad because we're not ordering cases to put the phones in. So we basically had a big mobility bin we put them in because they don't stack well. We had a big mobility bin. We had custom-made drawers. They locked in with foam, and away we went. A lot of the, the equipment and duty sections that had them issued to them, they actually had the phone issued to them, and some of them had them mounted in shelters on the wall. Some of the equipment was uh, built underneath a console. They, they, were, they were all taken care of, so when we went to field, all they had to do was hook them up. Um, they used WF-16 field wire, the four-wire stuff. I turn a binding post. Um, I have seen people use two two pieces of WD-1, just two wire field wire in a pinch. <coughs> Excuse me, because they forgot their WF-16. Uh, we've used Cat-5, so any four wire wire would work on there. Like I said, they're fairly reliable. Uh, most of the times you had problems with them is sometimes they drop a key, so you'd have to go around and, and just reissue the key in it. I think we had one phone we actually had to open and fix something. and we're not, We weren't allowed to do any work on the, the circuit board, but there was a wire that was, I think it was on the audio side. The audio was cutting in and out. And we all looked at it and see, and there's actually a wire that had come unsoldered from the back side of that little pot. They soldered it back on worked like a champ. Um, I know the DOD got rid of these. Like I said, this one has been demilled. And this is a, a T-Sec. KY68. I hope everybody learned something.